all of them died very young. In fact, my grandmother, she was murdered, and, and so, and we think my grandfather was too. Do you think those victims would have gotten any justice had the FBI not gotten involved? The way the case had been going before the Bureau started to get involved, uh, no, I don't think the, the cases would have been solved at all. As a historian, and specifically the FBI's historian, John Fox makes that statement based not on feel but fact, and notably the fact that unlike others who'd been brought in to solve the murders, the FBI agents, he says, were above corruption and produced convictions. They certainly made use as best they could of the tools that were available, but this was a time when forensic science was in its infancy. Just as the FBI was. Far from being the storied agency depicted in the FBI's in-house museum, the agency that would catch the Unabomber and the BTK killer, and catch the imagination of the American public by taking down gangsters like John Dillinger, the FBI was more or less unknown in the early 1920s when the Osage murders were taking place. The Bureau of Investigation, as the FBI was called, was pretty small. But a man named J. Edgar Hoover took the reins in 1924 as Osage leaders were pleading with the Bureau of Indian Affairs for help. It was Hoover who basically sent out the, the memos from Washington to our office in Oklahoma City saying, get on this. Fox is the first agents to work the case developed strong suspicions around Bill Hale, a powerful cattleman and the uncle of Ernest Burkhart. The self-proclaimed king of the Osage Hills, Hale owned a controlling interest in a local bank and held considerable political influence. One reason those agents hit a dead end. People weren't willing to speak. People were fearful. And of course, the, the Indians themselves didn't always you know, trust the, you know, the latest person knocking on the door wanting to know, know more. Under pressure to show that his agency was not only above board but competent, Hoover then made what turned out to be a critical decision. The Bureau realized it had to, to try and do something different in that sense, and I think that's when Hoover, among other things, sign, assigns Tom White as the head of the Oklahoma City office. A former Texas Ranger and railroad security man, Tom White took charge of the investigation in 1925. And Fox says it was under White that agents tried something that hadn't been done much before. They went undercover. By basically integrating themselves into the economy and the society there, they were able then to build trust with people and in doing so, of course, are able to gather the evidence that really allows them to focus on Hale. The FBI saw Hale as a kingpin. Investigators focused on murders that, in addition to being committed on tribal land where they had jurisdiction, also seemed to have a clear link to Hale, like the execution-style shooting of Henry Rowan. Right after Rowan was found murdered, Hale came out and you know, tried to make a claim on an insurance policy that he had taken out on Henry Rohn. They looked into the shooting death of Anna Brown and the house explosion that killed Rita and Bill Smith, all of them related, all pointing to someone trying to amass a fortune in headrights. The Bureau's agents were able to identify a couple of witnesses who had worked on aspects of the various plots that Hale had going and eventually get them to testify before the grand jury so that indictments could be put forward. Ernest Burkhardt was one of those to testify, turning on his uncle in 1926 and pleading guilty to being part of the conspiracy. Hale had persuaded Burkhardt to marry Molly Kyle while simultaneously arranging for the murders of her family, Anna Brown, Henry Rowan, Rita and Bill Smith, and investigators believe Molly was slowly being poisoned too. Despite hung juries, appeals, and every attempt to manipulate the system, Hale was convicted in 1929 and, like Burkhart, sentenced to life in prison. Both were later paroled, with Hale becoming a free man in 1947. He was forbidden from going back to the Osage territory. He ended up in, I believe, Phoenix, um, waiting tables. Hale died in 1962 at age 87, a long life compared to those he cut short in a brazen attempt to take wealth that wasn't his. He was definitely a cold-blooded criminal. How does he rank in, in, in the Bureau's pantheon of villains? He's certainly, you know, up there. Now, John Fox helped David Grand with Killers of the Flower Moon, but he admits he is not a big fan of the book's subtitle, saying he does not see the Osage murder case as the birth of the FBI. 
Still, he appreciates that the book and the movie will give people a better understanding of what the FBI does, which in 1920s Oklahoma, he says, was very good work. While federal agents were able to uncover the murder ring, the Osage were forced to finance part of the investigation with their own money. It seemed the system was working against them. More on that system in a moment.